Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby we bring you Cram Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Uh, today we're having a look at a paper um, that recently came out in the World General Surgery entitled Mortality Following Up and Disectomy in Patients with Liver Cirrhosis, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And Prof. Sababala Subramanian is then going to carry on his talks on evidence-based medicine. And today we had a special guest on our session, uh, the uh, first author of the paper, Adil Rashid, uh, joined our discussion, which was very interesting and fruitful. And I cannot thank him enough for uh, um, joining us on our journal club. Stay tuned for more. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela. I'm one of the um, CT2s currently in general surgery in Pinderfields Hospital, and I'll be presenting alongside my colleague, Gio. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a paper, which is a which is a sister, systematic review and a meta-analysis, um, which looked at uh, the mortality of patients with liver cirrhosis uh, following appendicectomy. So this paper was published in the World Journal of Surgery uh, this year, and uh, we have included the link um, on our presentation of, if you guys want to have a read of it as well. And on to you, Gio. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, so um, as we do know, uh, liver cirrhosis is a, a problem that is increasingly prevalent uh, in the UK and throughout the Western world, mostly because of uh, alcohol drinking habits and obviously the effect of long-standing um, hepatitis viruses. Um, and we do know that patients with liver cirrhosis don't do as well as patients without liver cirrhosis when they have emergency surgery of a variety of kinds. Um, and we don't exactly know how badly they do when they do have an appendicectomy, whether it's open or laparoscopic. So the aim of this paper is to look at mortality, first of all, but also complications, uh, and then to stay uh, in the cirrhotic patients that are undergoing an appendicectomy. So ball back to you, Angela. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you about the methods um, done um, for this paper. So the um, literature research um, was performed by using um, uh, databases such as Medline, Embase, and Cochrane, et cetera. Um, and the data that was collected, um, it was collected by two independent reviewers. And the main t uh, search titles and abstracts um, that was looked at was studies which were reporting um, post-operative outcomes in liver uh, cirrhosis patients following an appendicectomy, be it open or laparoscopic. In terms of the time period uh, that this paper looked at, it looked from any time up until March 2021. So this is showing uh, it's a very wide uh, time frame um, to look at uh, all these uh, at the various studies that may have been uh, published. Uh, now, looking at the inclusion and exclusion criteria, the main inclusion criteria for this paper was to only look at adult liver cirrhotic uh, patients following an appendicectomy. And also, um, if the studies had uh, mortality uh, outcomes, um, be it inpatient or 30 day mortality. Uh, the main exclusion criteria were um, patients who had also undergone liver surgery, um, such as transplant shirt surgery or shunt related surgery in relation to their uh, liver cirrhosis. As well as this, uh, children with uh, liver cirrhosis were also excluded, animal studies and uh, meeting ab abstracts and such and case reports and case series were also excluded in this um, in this paper. And over to you, Gio. Wonderful. So as we mentioned at the beginning, the primary outcome of this study is mainly looking at inpatient and 30-day post-operative mortality. And this is 
ultimately analyzed as a pooled measure uh, in the meta-analytic part uh, of the study. Uh, secondary outcomes that the authors looked at are hospital length of stay and post complications, which include a variety of them, from uh, procedure-specific complications to complications such as pneumonias. Uh, statistical analysis proposed by them uh, is pretty standard. Um, they looked at statistical heterogeneity using guy-square statistics, and they do touch on uh, uh, clinical heterogeneity, which, um, as you can uh, probably assume, is a significant issue with uh, the studies published uh, about this particular topic. Uh, Bob, back to you, Angela. Thank you. So now I'm going to talk to you about the uh, polled data that the paper obtained. So this is a Prisma uh, flow diagram of all the polled studies they had found using the database search. They initially found 948 papers. Um, following the removal of uh, duplicates and uh, the removal of studies which had exclusion criteria, um, there was only a total number of four studies uh, which could be included for a systematic review. Of those, only three could be used for a um, meta-analysis because one of the studies did not have a control group. And over to you, Gio. Wonderful. So as you mentioned, four studies were included and published between 2001 and 2019, so a fairly large time span. Uh, two studies were conducted in the US and one in Denmark, and those three are nationwide database studies. One study was conducted in Japan, and it is a retrospective multicenter observational study, which includes two uh, centers uh, specifically. Um, so a variety of settings, and uh, uh, you would argue a variety of designs, because um, the vast majority of the studies included are database studies, and one is actually a specifically designed core study. Uh, there is nothing in the literature that is uh, more prospectively designed. Uh, Bob, back to you, Angela. Thank you. And now I'm going to talk to you about the patient um, and study characteristics. Um, of the four studies uh, that were included, there was a total number of just over 168,000 patients with a roughly 50-50 split of male to female patients. Um, of those number of patients, it, there were only 0.5% um, of those uh, with liver cirrhosis and the rest being patients who were, did not have cirrhosis, which is a quite a, a low number. Um, the patients were further categorized um, between them being uh, having cirrhosis or not uh, and and non cirrhotic patients, and the method of appendectomy they had. In terms of the um, classification of uh, the liver cirrhosis, um, the studies only used um, compensated or decompensated um, cirrhosis as a as a type of severity. There were no formal uh, liver cirrhosis severity scoring system um, to categor categorize uh, the patient, uh, each patient's um, uh, liver cirrhosis. But looking at this uh, data, um, there was a similar number of patients who underwent, underwent laparoscopic and appendicectomy between both uh, uh, groups. Um, the more interesting thing is that um, patients with um, patients who un, cirrhotic patients um, went for more more of them went for non-operative management versus patients with uh, non-cirrhosis and as well as this uh, non-cirrhotic patients um, more of them underwent an open appendicectomy compared to cirrhotic patients and in terms of uh, the different the different studies um, we have also included the studies here in the, on the table and the method of um, append the method of an appendicectomy that was performed for, for each Paulson was the only one who um, did not specify the, their method of um, operation now over to you Gio wonderful so uh, going to uh, the more salient results, uh, three studies, as we mentioned, reported on inpatient mortality. 
And as you would expect, cirrhotic patients do tend to do worse uh, to uh, an extent that is as reported here. So a mortality reported from 0 to 1.7% and 017 to 0.3% without cirrhosis. And if you look through the rest of the results, you realize that the worst outcomes are generally uh, in decompensated cirrhosis and uh, mostly in a conservative management group. Um, generally speaking, if you have an open appendisectomy and if you have decompensated cirrhosis, you do worse. And this applies similarly to 30-day mortality. Uh, Bob, back to you, Angela. Thank you. And now I'm going to talk to you about um, the outcomes for the length of stay um, following appendicectomy. And the outcomes have shown uh, similar uh, data and with as such as the mortality. Overall, all the studies have shown worse out, uh, a prolonged length of stay in patients with liver cirrhosis in comparison to uh, patients with, uh, with uh, without cirrhosis. As well as this, uh, the paper has also shown that um, patients with decompensated liver cirrhosis had a much more prolonged length of stay, about threefold uh, compared to uh, patients uh, with, uh, without cirrhosis. And as well as this, um, it has also shown that um, having an open appendicectomy uh, prolongs your length of stay com in, in comparison to uh, having uh, it laparoscopic. So very similar uh, data um, with all, all the outcomes that the paper has looked at. And over to you, Gio. Yes, and uh, finally, we are talking about post-operative complications. Um, so uh, as you can see, there's, there's a slight variation across the studies included. However, generally speaking, uh, if you have an open appendicectomy and if you have cirrhosis, particularly decompensated, you tend to do worse again. Uh, tend to be more prone to infections and tend to, generally speaking, have uh, worse outcomes. Um, ball to you, Angela. Thank you. So now I'm going to talk to you about the meta-analysis of this paper. The um, only three of the studies were able to be um, analyzed as the Tugawa paper did not have a control group. Um, so this um, meta-analysis is looking at the mortality and this ranged from inpatient mortality to 30-day uh, mortality post-op. And essentially it has shown that um, the mortality in uh, liver cirrhosis patients is much higher in non-cirrhotic patients. And um, when this is compared with the control group, there is um, a much increased risk of mortality with um, statistical, uh, with high statistical significance with an odds ratio of um, nine. Um, as well as this, um, it has also shown a moderately low um, statistical heterogeneity, uh, but this could explain this could be explained due to the uh, very low number of studies um, that was um, included in this paper, and so uh, all, all the studies have essentially shown very similar uh, data. And now over to you, Gia. Oh, you know, it was me. So, in terms of, uh, we're going to talk to you about the limitations of this paper. Um, so, one of all the important limitations that we have, that the paper has reported is that only four studies were uh, identified, and this is a very low number um, to base um, to formulate a, um, a good uh, conclusion. Um, and as well as this, only 0.5% uh, of the patients had liver cirrhosis, and it's such a low number. It's very difficult to interpret um, the data. Um, and have a good understanding of what um, the actual outcomes are of patients postoperatively. Um, another limitation is the paper did not, um, the studies um, did not have, um, um, did not have a control for confounding factors such as age and patients with other comorbidities, as that may, will most definitely impact the patient's uh, 
mortality and prolonged length of stay and um, 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 post-operative complications. And as well as this, there's also um, a lack of information when it comes to um, reporting the severity of the patient's um, uh, appendicitis. Was it um, uncomplicated or was it perforated? Because that will implicate um, the mortality risk and complications post-op. And the study had only used uh, clinical coding um, to base each patient's uh, level of uh, liver cirrhosis, be it compensated or decompensated. There was no formal use of um, severity scoring like a child pew uh, scoring uh, for liver cirrhosis. Um, so those were the, one of the main uh, limitations the paper had found. Right. Um, we uh, just wanted to touch uh, a few other points that we picked up discussing the paper. Um, now, the authors do pull together two mortality measures in patients in 30 days. And looking at the amount of, of data out there, they really don't have another choice. However, uh, it is well, reasonably well known, at least, that uh, uh, the increased mortality risk for cirrhotic patients undergoing an emergency surgical operation tend to persist even after discharge and up to 30 days. And if you look at the data from the papers included, um, the highest mortality rate, if I'm not mistaken, is from the paper that includes data up to 30 days. Um, that could potentially, putting them together, lead to a falsely lower estimate of mortality. However, again, it has to do with the papers that uh, are available out there. Um, I think there's a huge degree of clinical heterogeneity uh, in uh, um, in uh, the papers um, and the patient agreement in the variety of papers that are analyzed in this meta-analysis. Uh, and this is because of the time span um, between the uh, early 2000 and 2018, 2019, uh, treatment trends have changed. Uh, certainly concerning management of appendicitis became much more popular uh, after the uh, sort of publication of the APAC trial. Uh, and the recent publication of cohort studies um, related to this topic, which we discussed in previous sessions of the Journal Club as well. Um, and there is undoubtedly a selection bias, probably, uh, well, I feel at least for the uh, non operative management group, which appears to have the worst outcome as well, um, as um, instinctively as a surgeon, you would be inclined to offer non-operative management to patients that you think are not fit for an operation. And similarly, there are technical difficulties associated with doing a laparoscopic operation in the presence of ascites, which might have changed the um, surgical approach chosen. Uh, that there is a degree of data granularity in pretty much all, all big database studies. And um, especially as Angela was mentioning, about identifying patients with the compensated or compensated cirrhosis that will undoubtedly have um, an effect uh, in the final result. Um, so ball back to you, Angela, for conclusions. Thank you. So in conclusion, uh, there were three main points that uh, the paper uh, um, concluded is that um, patients with decompensated um, liver cirrhosis had a, a increased risk of mortality and worsening outcomes. Patients who um, were treated um, non-operatively um, had worse outcomes also. In terms of um, treating, patient, treating patients um, who are deemed fit for surgery, a laparoscopic appendicectomy um, is seen as the safest option out of um, compared to open. Uh, but overall, uh, the quality of data is very limited because there are only four studies um, were used and um, the patients uh, with liver cirrhosis that were looked at was, it was a very, very small sample uh, size. So um, the overall conclusion was essentially open uh, to interpretation, interpretation because it's very difficult to uh, formulate a uh, a formal conclusion as the patients with liver cirrhosis it's it's all essentially kind of based on um 
their clinical presentation and the severity of their condition. Um, so it it is difficult to say whether one um, one treatment option is better than the other. But um, so yeah, that was the overall um, conclusion of the paper. A brief summary about the discussion we had um, during the session concerning the paper. Um, first of all, uh, we reiterated a few points, um, again, uh, with um, Adil Rashid, um, first author of the paper, um, particularly concerning the difficulties they encountered uh, putting together this um, meta-analysis given the low level of evidence available out there. And uh, we all agree that the main issue is really that the quality of the papers available in the literature is severely limited. There's a couple of additional points we touched on, uh, particularly regarding the methods. Our main concern uh, relates to the inclusion of what is a case control study, uh, together with um, three cohort studies in the um, systematic review and um, in the meta-analytic part of uh, this research. Um, Including case control studies uh, together with core studies um, can be problematic, particularly when approaching uh, a meta-analysis as uh, core studies tend to create a, a rather artificial condition where um, the epidemiology of a condition, uh, in this particular case liver cirrhosis, uh, is matched with healthy controls. And I will encourage you to look at our episode on study designs um, to get a bit more about that. Uh, a further point that we touched on, uh, which we feel was very relevant, relates to the conclusions of this paper. Um, the uh, authors conclude by saying that uh, the laparoscopic approach might be safer um, in a cirrhotic patients. Um, we do feel that this is a little bit of a leap um, and that the data available from the literature probably doesn't, given uh, granularity uh, and uh, uh, inclusion biases uh, affecting the sudden inclusion of meta-analysis, um, to reach such conclusion. And uh, what the authors propose as a conclusion is obviously a possible interpretation of, of the data available, but again, a possible interpretation, not the only one out there. Particularly, uh, both myself and my presenter colleague felt that um, the results uh, can significantly be affected, particularly by selection bias, um, particularly concerning the choice of non-operative management, which is probably associated with um, the level of fitness of the patient, as well as the choice of open appendicectomy versus laparoscopic appendicectomy, particularly in presence of ascites. I'll uh, leave you now um, to the presentation um, of Professor Saba on uh, evidence-based medicine and particularly researching evidence. Thank you. We are doing a series on introduction to evidence-based medicine, right? Um, and therefore, this is a continuation of that series. And this talk is going to be focusing uh, on acquiring evidence. So. So acquiring evidence falls under the second stage, a step two in the practice of evidence-based medicine. You've heard from me before that there are five steps, or you're probably aware of this, and they include asking the right clinical question, acquiring the evidence, and then appraising and interpreting the evidence, applying it to your practice, and then assessing or evaluating uh, the whole process, right? So those are the five steps of EBM and we're going to talk a little bit about acquiring evidence. Now, why would you need to acquire evidence? So you might need to acquire evidence when you wanted to understand a topic better, you wanted to uh, um, understand the background of a clinical condition or, or an operation or a complication, right? So you can improve your understanding. So as a trainee, you might see a patient, let's say with abdominal pain due to a rare condition called uh, porphyria and you know nothing about porphyria so you wanted to read about it. Uh, for the rest of this talk I'm going to be looking at a problem from a thyroid cancer perspective and I'm going to be uh, talking about 
um, doing central neck dissections in thyroid cancer, um, and, and then therefore uh, that'll be my example. So if you've not come across central neck dissection before and you've assisted um, your consultant, you want to know what a central neck dissection is, what's it, its role in thyroid cancer. So therefore you would uh, like an overview of this particular topic. Right. So this kind of question falls under the category of what we call background questions, as opposed to another kind of question that falls under the category of foreground questions. So there you have a specific clinical question. Uh, you have uh, observed, for example, the surgeon using drains uh, in the neck after doing a central neck dissection. And then there's been some controversy and another surgeon in the firm says, there's not much point putting drains in, and therefore you want to um, uh, look into whether a drain is of value in a central like that section. So these kind of questions will aid your clinical decision making. You might even want to perform a systematic review on this particular controversy of whether to put drain in following a central like that section. Okay, so a typical foreground question in this kind of scenario would be, should a drain be used after central neck dissection in thyroid cancer surgery? Right, so uh, with the background question, like the one that I've mentioned, what is the central neck compartment and what is the role of central neck dissection in thyroid cancer? Essentially, the answers revolve around the boundaries of the central compartment, the anatomy or the organs that lie within the central compartment, the indications of central neck dissection, its utility in clinical practice, the various approaches, techniques, risks, and so on and so forth. So for this, the thing to go uh, to would be a textbook, uh, at least in the olden days. So you could look up an anatomy textbook to start off with, and then a surgical textbook or both. Um, and these could be very generic books, or they could be specialty specific books. There are books on thyroid cancer surgery that you could look into. Another uh, source and the source that is more often used these days are topic reviews. These are narrative or educational topic reviews, as opposed to a systematic review that we've just heard about. And these topic reviews often give an overview and very detailed explanations. And some of the more recent ones will include updates on new advances and also touch upon the controversies uh, around doing central neck dissections. OK, now, whether you go into to a textbook or look for a review really depends on uh, your needs, uh, at what level of training you are, uh, you know, your experience and also access, because some of these detailed topic reviews are behind a uh, paywall and then you may not get access to that. So um, what about uh, a foreground question? Now, I've said previously in one of uh, my other talks that a foreground question need, uh, needs to be uh, very uh, clearly structured. So this uh, may be an example of a structured foreground question that I've uh, mentioned before. Does the use of a drain after central neck dissection in thyroid surgery reduce the risk of bleeding and wound collection? So that's a very clear question. And to answer this, you might go and look for a systematic review and meta-analysis like the one we just heard. And that would be ideal if there was a systematic review or meta-analysis. Often there isn't. And then you are left with looking at primary research articles, good quality primary research articles that specifically focus on this particular question. So um, how do you identify these um, papers, either systematic reviews or primary articles by searching and one of various online databases. Now, when you're doing literature searching um, and you want to read about literature searching, now, if you have to do a search to conduct a very comprehensive systematic review or to write a clinical practice guideline for a society, for example, they can be quite complex. And some of these comprehensive searches, such as those done for systematic reviews for complex interventions might require specialist skills and experience. And you've got information specialists that actually will do the searching for a systematic reviewer. However, what we need to do as practicing clinicians is do some very simple searches, some very practical, sorry, searches to address practical questions. And we can effectively search literature using some um, really straightforward techniques, which with practice we can improve upon 
and improve the efficiency of our searches and their usefulness as well. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, there are various search techniques. And whenever there are various methods to address a problem, uh, you can conclude that there's no one optimum way. Yeah. And what method you choose really depends on precisely what your needs are and the time you've got and whether you've got any additional money to pay for some papers and, and then the overall feasibility. Um, I would say that these methods are all complementary. So there's no one perfect method, like I said. These are not mutually exclusive. And I'm going to mention a few um, techniques um, and then uh, uh, just very briefly um, discuss that in the context of central -like dissection in thyroid cancer surgery. So one of the most basic techniques is what we call basic searching where you do a really quick search to find a couple of good articles that you can then read about overnight and then go and talk to your boss the next day. That'll help you improve understanding of the topic. And to do that, you just need a couple of uh, key phrases, something like dissection and thyroid uh, cancer, and you might put that in PubMed or Google and see if you can get a couple of good articles fairly quickly. Another thing, uh, another technique uh, that is often used um, is called berry picking, where following a basic search, you scan the searches to pick up some articles of interest. And this may be based on some certain specific features. It may be that you find uh, an article written by an author you know, like maybe Geo Perrin, and you know that Geo Perrin is a, uh, writes very well, so you can just pick up the articles that he's written. Or you might focus your attention on a particular technique of uh, central -like dissection and then explore that technique a bit further and look at similar articles on that specific technique. So clearly, berry picking is very subjective. It is completely based on your needs and your interest. Uh, it, you can use it to explore topics that you're not familiar at all with. Another technique um, in this regard is something called pearl growing. You may have heard of this. So essentially, um, you start off with a very focused, precise search to find a paper, an index paper, which is the pearl. And you read the paper and you identify keywords and then you modify your own search and continue the process, get a few more papers, and then see if you can uh, um, identify more uh, useful, relevant keywords and search further afield. Now, in, with our example, in the context of central -like dissection in thyroid cancer, you may land uh, on a paper describing a very specific central -like dissection technique. And looking at the paper, you find certain additional terms like maybe radical central -like dissection or limited central -like dissection or thymus preserving central -like dissection. And you use these additional terms to search further. Also, in some databases like PubMed, there is a feature called related articles or similar articles. So you can click on those and you might get some more papers that are very closely uh, related to the index article. Another technique uh, and a phrase that you'll probably come across if you're doing systematic reviews is something called citation searching or snowballing. Basically, what it means is that let's say you've got a specific article in hand and you want to find uh, all articles that are very similar to this article. So you can do either what is called backward searching, where you look at this specific article's list of references and search for articles of interest. Or you look forward, forward searching, where you look at the sites or papers that have cited the specific article. And this helps you to identify similar manuscripts. And a lot of people say that this is uh, nowadays considered mandatory if you're doing a systematic review. And then this will ensure that no articles of interest are missed. I've got two more, I think. So uh, hopefully this is not too um, monotonous. The next technique is what we call concept building or building blocks. So here what you do is you first frame certain concepts and then you put the concepts together to formulate an effective search strategy. And this is what is typically used in systematic review searches alongside other techniques, but this is the main technique. So the concepts um, around the problem that we are talking about now are, for example, thyroid cancer, central -like dissection, drain, and, and maybe complications or bleeding and so on. 
But finally, and I won't dwell on this, but there is a technique uh, called successive fractions. I've not used this uh, before, but essentially what they say is this is a variant of concept building. So you have these concepts, or some people call them facets, where the concepts are added or removed in steps. So you start off with a very specific initial concept, and then uh, you, you can add other concepts or drop some concepts as well. Also, um, what they say with this technique is that you can partition your searches to make things more manageable. Because sometimes you land up with 100,000 or 500,000 hits and uh, um, you're a bit stuck. You're not really sure what to do. So what you can do is you can partition the searches. For example, if your main focus is central leg dissection, you can do a search that is looking at central leg dissection and technique, another search that's looking at central leg dissection and complications, and a third one looking at central leg dissection and indications and so on. And this typically would be part of a scoping review. And then you can decide which ones you really have the ability to focus on, which ones you would like to uh, drop off. Okay, so let's come back to our structured foreground clinical question, which is whether to do a drain or not to drain a central neck compartment after a neck dissection, and does that have an impact on the outcomes? Okay, so the concepts. So the concepts here, um, uh, I hope you'd agree, are one is central leg dissection in thyroid cancer. So you can do central leg dissection in um, laryngeal resections or pharyngeal resections, but we're talking here of just thyroid cancer. So you could consider these as two concepts. Another concept is drain. That's like the intervention. And then a third concept could be uh, one or more outcomes like bleeding, wound collections, reoperation, and so on. Now, Let's put these concepts in a table. So the first one you've got is central neck dissection. So you've got to think about keywords or different ways of describing central neck dissection. So you could just call it neck dissection, or you could say dissection of the central compartment. Another name for central neck is level six and seven. So that could be another name and so on. So again, for thyroid cancer, um, papers could refer to thyroid cancer or they could refer just to papillary thyroid cancer, which is where the neck dissection is primarily performed, or they might just say thyroid malignancy. So those are the different ways of describing this particular concept. And then you've got drain. You've got lots of different words for drain, draining, drainage, suction tube, and so on. And obviously you've got outcomes, but just to keep this short, uh, I won't go any further with the concepts. Now, you will find that there's another empty column here that refers to medical subject headings. So before I go on to list medical subject headings, we need to talk about what they are very briefly. So medical subject headings are just another name for control vocabulary. So control vocabulary is used by um, uh, the databases, um, um, which is essentially a set of specific terms. And they're simply called MESH in PubMed. That's all it is. Medical subject headings is just another name for control vocabulary. So essentially, it refers to a single specific concept that encompasses multiple different terms, right? For example, if you're talking about neck dissection, then you might mean radical neck dissection, lymph node dissection, block dissection. So essentially, what the database will do is say, fine, we'll have just one phrase and that will be part of our control vocabulary. And any other of these phrases will all slot into this one phrase. OK, so if you have an article in these databases, every article will be tagged by a number of mesh headings. And if you search using mesh headings, then it helps to include articles that use any of these alternative names uh, because you're searching for that concept that is uh, that is denoted by this particular mesh heading, and therefore all the other articles that describe uh, the same concept using different terms will come up in your search. Okay, let's just do a, a quick um, example um, using the concept of central leg dissection. So let's go into the NLM NIH website very briefly, and then there is um, the database mesh. And if you want to look at central leg dissection, you write central leg dissection and then see whether this is actually a mesh. Central leg dissection is not a mesh because it says no item found. 
So then uh, what you know is that something like dissection is not coded for as a medical subject heading. So if you want to try neck dissection, yeah, you get neck dissection as a mesh concept. So they give you the meaning of that um, particular uh, mesh. The meaning is described. And they also tell you when the mesh was introduced. And this is important. This mesh was introduced in 2003. And I'll tell you in, in a minute why that is important. If you then go down, you will find that neck dissection is in the hierarchy of, um, in this particular hierarchy. So it comes under lymph node excision um, in one of the trees, and then it comes under otorhinolaryngologic surgical procedures in another uh, mesh tree. Okay, so you could put that uh, mesh into the PubMed search builder, and then you can search PubMed if you want. Right, so you got more than eight thousand articles on neck dissection as a mesh heading. So let's go back to our uh, discussion. Uh, to our discussion, so we found that central neck dissection is not a mesh term, so we use neck dissection instead. But obviously, you do not want articles on selective neck dissections and lateral neck dissections and so on. So you want articles on central, so you add central or level six or level seven and so on to the mesh term using what we call Boolean operators. So you've probably all heard of Boolean operators. There are three basic ones, and, or, and not. The word Boolean really is after a guy called George Boole, who's, who's a mathematician. So there's nothing more uh, to it than, than that. And so you can use these operators to combine mesh words with keywords or multiple keywords. Just remember that if you use Boolean operators, you've got to keep in mind that the operator and takes precedence. That's the primary operator. And always uh, when you're searching in various search engines, just remember to write Boolean operators in all caps. Okay. Now, going back to mesh headings for a second. Now, although mesh headings are really uh, useful, you've got to be aware of some limitations. So the first one is that you may not have mesh for all of the concepts that you are interested in. For example, for central neck dissection, there is no mesh term. The other problem is recent articles may not have been meshed or mesh indexed. So if you've just got, if you've got an article in the last few months, they wouldn't have had the time to index it and give allocate mesh categories. The last problem is that um, mesh terms are added on a regular basis to uh, Medline, PubMed. So um, if your mesh term has only been added in the last few five years, for example, then the articles that uh, relate to this concept from five years ago will not be uh, retrieved because the mesh terms do not apply to articles published before they were introduced. So no one's going back retrospectively and tagging all the um, articles in history. Okay, so we've talked about mesh heading and we come back to this table where we've got the concepts listed in this column on the left. We've got the keywords in the middle and then I've put down the mesh headings for the various concepts. So for central neck dissection, I've got just neck dissection as the mesh heading, so that is not sufficient. So I'll have to combine that with some keywords. And then for thyroid cancer, I've got a mesh heading. And for drain, I've got a mesh heading called drainage. Okay. Now, the next step uh, is to combine the keywords in the mesh to formulate the search strategy to then go on to search. Okay. Before we do that, we need to talk about a few more terminologies. So first one is Boolean operators and or and not. We've already talked about this, so I won't dwell on it. The second um, terminology is what, what is what we call truncation. Now truncation is something that you adopt for keywords where you simply add a symbol, asterisk in PubMed, to search for various variations in the keyword. For example, with drain, if you write drain asterisk, uh, the PubMed will search for drains, draining, drainage, and so on. PubMed needs at least four characters to truncate, and then uh, it'll search for the first 600 variations, which is much more than you will ever need. But the, the other um, uh, terminologies to, to, to know about is something called quotes and parentheses. Now, if you put something uh, within quotes, you could put a series of words within quotes, and then 
uh, the database will search for that exact phrase within the quotes. So that's quite useful. For example, central neck dissection. So it will only search for um, papers where the full phrase is, uh, is included in that order. Parenthesis, or the brackets, is used for uh, nesting. And I'll explain what nesting is. So nesting helps bring together keywords and concepts to then form your final search strategy. And this nesting is done using parentheses. So for example, if you wanted to uh, search for central neck dissection, you know that you've got neck dissection as a mesh word, and then you're adding central or level six or level seven. And just in case you're not familiar, level six and level seven are parts of the central compartment of the neck. So you pull these together with the Boolean operator or, and then you combine this with the neck dissection as a mesh heading and use the Boolean operator and, and you've got um, uh, the use of parentheses to nest the various phrases, the various uh, keywords together. Then you've got field tags. This is something I don't tend to use at all, uh, but if you wanted to limit your search to specific fields of a citation, and let's say you get 100,000 articles and you don't have the time to go through all of those, then you can um, specify that you only want to include those keywords if they, are, um, if they are within the title or within the title or abstract, or you could say if they're anywhere in the text. So these are tags without which all the fields of a citation would be searched. If you tag it to a specific field, then only that specific field will be searched. Okay, so yeah. So you come back to this table. Now the concepts are still there. And now you've got the strategy for each of these concepts. So for central like that section, you've got a strategy that combines certain keywords with the Boolean operator or alongside the neck dissection as a mesh heading, and that's combined with and. Then for thyroid cancer, you've got thyroid neoplasms. And for drain, you've got either drain with asterisks or drainage as a mesh heading. Now, obviously you can change this. You can, you can, you can try different, um, different kinds of strategies and see what kind of results you get. So I, put, uh, I combined these, uh, these strategies for the three different concepts and put them in PubMed and I got about 33 articles. Okay, and then I'll look at the 33 articles and, and see, um, and, and I might just read a few and that seem uh, good quality and hopefully that'll answer my question. You've got to remember that these uh, search processes are or should be iterative. So you've got to be able to go back and modify the search, make some amendments, minor or major, and you can do that by either adding concepts or um, keywords or field tags or limits, and you can you know you can limit this by by period or language and so on and so forth, right? So uh, in in our specific example, um, we haven't talked about outcomes as a concept. So you could add a concept relating to outcome, and that could be like bleeding or collection or reoperation, and that could be done to narrow the search even further. From thirty three, you might find that you just get two or three articles on the use of drain after central neck dissection in thyroid cancer surgery. Okay, so I hope that, that was helpful. So I'll summarize what we've discussed so far. So we talked very briefly about foreground and background questions, and we've done this uh, in more detail in a previous talk. And, and then the, uh, these are the questions that you, uh, you will want to be, uh, you'll want to answer by doing a literature search. We talked about a number of search techniques, the basic searching, berry picking, pearl growing, citation searching, and concept building. We dwelled on concept building, and I very briefly um, and very quickly, I guess, ran through a concept building search using PubMed. We talked again quite briefly, but hopefully um, uh, you've heard of these terms before, or if not, you can go and read about them. Uh, it's useful, I think, to be familiar with what these terms mean. Mesh, Boolean operators, quotes, parentheses, nesting, and field tags. And if you haven't done many searches before um, and you feel nervous about it, you'll get better really, really quickly with just a little practice.
Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.